I want to start off tonight, by the way, for those of you that don't know, this is Tom Price. He does the Calvary Chapel Magazine. And Tom. Wow, look at this. Yeah. Are you on? You got me back there. Wow, what a full house. I should not have started that rumor that Amir Safadi was going to be with you tonight. <laughs> I'm, I'm yeah. sorry. I couldn't help myself. <laughs> so I want to start off just by sharing a few opening comments about our trip to Israel, some of the things that I took away from that trip, uh, and then we'll get into some of the photos tonight. And uh, just a, a quick warning, there will be a couple of photos, and, and there are some stories tonight that are very heavy um, and it's, it's hard. It's hard to take in. Um, it was really hard for me to process when I was there. Uh, but I think it's necessary that we see the evil that was perpetrated and that we understand uh, why it is so important right now that we are supporting Israel uh, during this time. And so I want to start off by saying that one of the things I heard several times while I was in Israel is that what Israel is facing is actually a war of religion. And it's, it's not just a simple war. It's a war of religion in which Islam is looking to wipe Judaism off the map. And uh, anybody that tells you that Islam is a peaceful religion, you know, I, I have a bridge to sell you in New Jersey that I would really like to, to sell you. Because it, it's a pack of lies. Islam is not a peaceful religion. Um, they, they will tell you Many of them will tell you, well, it's just the extremists, it's the extremists. But if you actually read the Quran and you study the Quran, as you will hear in testimony tonight from a, a young man from Iran that I captured on, on my phone, um, giving a, a short bit of his testimony, he will tell you that, it, that the teachings of Islam do not lead to peace. And, and that's the dangerous thing about it. Uh, and, and so when we see, you know, Islam on the rise in our own country, we see Islam, you know, sending into the ranks of the politicians, we, we need to be interceding against that because it's dangerous. Uh, it's an ideology that will uh, uh, eventually look to wipe out all other religions. Um, and that's what's happening over in Israel. They are seeing the actual face of Islam. Uh, in Israel. And so we need to understand that. And it's very important for us to understand, too, that our theology matters. You know, what you believe about God and the source of, of where you get those beliefs, all of that is so, so incredibly important because it leads to uh, what, what we see happening today in Israel. Um, and so Islam is, is a, here's, a, here's the second thing that I took away from my trip there, is that Islam is really playing a long game they're playing a long game. They have, uh, the, the, they have the surface, what's going on publicly, what is open to the public eye. But then there's below the surface. And actually, the tunnel system in Gaza is a perfect example of this. You see, because the billions of dollars in aid that Gaza has received has not gone to bettering the, the cities of Palestine, the people of Palestine. The, the, they've done nothing to, to really add or edify to build up the lives of the Palestinians. It's all gone into this underground network of tunnels and fueling the terrorism militias that actually perpetrated these evil acts, Hamas, uh, that, that, that Hamas perpetrated against Israel. And so it's a, it's a picture of, on the surface, you know, you have Qatar, who's pouring $4.7 billion annually into pushing Islam in the Western culture. They're pushing it in our universities. They're pushing it in public places, uh, trying to paint Islam with this peaceful face. But then underneath the surface, they're building a terror structure, a network of tunnels by which they can uh, train uh, you know, militias and attack uh, Israel. Pastor and, Phil, if I can just add there that we yeah. learned while we were over there that on October the 7th in Gaza, there were tremendous celebrations for what they called a great victory over Zionism. Can you imagine having celebrations over the atrocities that they did in, that, in, that, in those kibbutzes and in those towns? Yeah. They celebrated it. Yeah, and, and just so you know, Israel's the little Satan. We're the big Satan. And, and, and uh, so th 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 that's all that to say that, that it, Israel is living in a constant state of pressure today. 
they are, they are surrounded, completely surrounded by enemies in the region, in that region of the world. And um, we don't know what it's like to live with that kind of pressure on a daily basis, but many, many Israelis are living in a post-traumatic stress state permanently. That, that's what they live with. And what that's done is over time, this is one of the things that I learned while I was there, is this is like, a, like the analogy of a frog that's been placed in a pot and slowly boiled to death. You slowly turn up the heat, and the frog doesn't know that he needs to get out of that water. Well, the same thing has happened with the Israeli people in the constant state of pressure that they're under, the constant state of attacks. Since 2001, it was in 2001 that the very first rocket was fired from the Gaza Strip into Sidrat in southern Israel. And since then, there's been over 100,000 rockets that have been launched into Israel. But the, the crazy thing about it is what we were talking to the, the civilians that are living there in Sidorat, they got into this mentality. They just built bomb shelters and hid in bomb shelters. But, but this time, now they're waking up to the fact that they can't continue to live like that. that, that they can no longer live like they should be making the Palestinian people build bomb shelters not the other way around. Why are the Israelis living like this where every time there's a siren, they go running for the shelters? That's no way to live. And what that's done is it's created a, a high amount of post-traumatic stress amongst the population there. And uh, they're, they're actually, uh, this is one of the things, this is one of the other themes that came out. And this, this will be my last, well, second, second to last thing I want to say before we jump into the pictures and the slideshow. But I want to say that the, the terrorists used the love and the kindness of the people in the kibbutzes along the Gazan border against them. And so these people that were living in the kibbutzes, they were actually kind of had the wool pulled over their eyes thinking, oh, we can live in peace. We can live together in peace with these people. And, you know, Gazans were coming across the border. The Palestinians coming across the border every day, working in their gardens, working on their houses, uh, building things for them, doing all kinds of, of, of work within Israel. But while they were doing this, they were actually mapping out these communities. They were numbering the houses. They were designating the houses that had dogs. They were, they were designating which houses or where the weapons were kept, uh, where the security post was, all of these kinds of things. And, and, and this, all this information was going, being fed back into the Hamas network in Gaza. And so what I took from that, uh, real quick, let me, just, let me just finish with this. What I took from that, guys, is that we cannot be loving and tolerant without discernment. Uh, the Bible tells us that we're to be wise as serpents, gentle as doves, but wise as serpents. And, and we can't just have this idea that we're going to love people into the kingdom of God. Now, Jesus did, of course, teach that we're to love our enemies, but we're not to do that without discernment and without wisdom and without an understanding that we need to protect and, and, and that we need to be careful about what we're uh, allowing around us. And so that, that was something that really hit me hard, Tom, was that, you know, we need to have a, a love for people, but that needs to be balanced with a discernment and a wisdom in the way that we're going to deal with them. This uh, one woman said that she has six children and you have to have, it's only seconds that you have to get to the bomb shelter. She gave up trying to get six kids out of bed and into the bomb shelter. So they sleep in the bomb shelter. And, of course, there's no air conditioning in here. And Israel's a hot place, you know. And can you imagine being forced? And it's just like if someone was up at Truckee launching uh, rockets at us every day. Would we just go like, oh, well, let's just run to our bomb shelter? Uh, no, it's, it's like they just feel like they've given everything. And like Pastor Phil said, they mapped out and used their kindness against them. Matter of fact, that... Um, kibbutz was considered what they called peacenik. They were all, they, they wanted to prove to the world that they could truly live in a two-state solution. They could live side by side, but on October 7th, they were proved dramatically wrong, and they will never, ever be the same again. Yeah, that two-state solution thing is, that's old. <laughs> it's not going to work. Um, the last thing I want to say before we start our, our slideshow is this, that I was warned on several occasions by different Israelis that they were overtaken, uh, they were taken by surprise by this attack, uh, even though they had intelligence 
that this was this was uh, coming together, they were so um, oblivious to the fact that they could actually pull this off. And so they thought, no, that will never happen. It was on their list of possibilities, but it was on the list that said, well, it's possible, but not probable at all. And that was how this attack was able to be carried out. And uh, th so over and over again, I was told, listen, you need to be warned because this is coming to America. This is coming to America. And, and so, guys, we need to take that warning seriously, I believe. I, I believe that we need to take the warning seriously. And so, you know, thankfully here in America, praise God for the freedom that we have to, to uh, do concealed carry or open carry, thankfully, in the state of Nevada, right? Uh, I'm thankful for that um, because, yeah, we, we should be ready to defend ourselves against evil. When evil comes, you can't, you can't uh, compromise with it. You can't just try to pacify it. When, when evil comes, we need to be ready. And it's a good analogy for our spiritual life, too, um, because all throughout the, the scriptures we read, uh, you know, how many times God has to warn us not to, uh, you know, play games with evil, not to sweep evil under the carpet, not to treat it like a, a secret pet or uh, our little pet. We have to be serious about the evil in our lives. And that goes for us, too. That goes for the things in our own personal lives. Um, and that's, that's challenging for me. That's challenging for me to process as well. I, I want to uh, read this scripture to you guys, and then we'll, we'll jump into the slides. This is from Deuteronomy chapter 7. When God has, is communicating to his people Israel that he has chosen them, and he says to them, When the Lord your God brings you into the land which you go to possess and has cast out many nations before you, the Hittites and the Girgashites and the Amorites and the Canaanites and the Perizzites and the Hivites and the Jebusites, seven nations greater, greater and mightier than you. And when the Lord your God delivers them over to you, you shall conquer them and utterly destroy them. You shall make no covenant with them, nor show mercy to them. Nor shall you make marriages with them, nor shall you give your daughter to their son, nor take their daughter for your son. For they will turn your sons away from following me to serve other gods. So the anger of the Lord will be aroused against you and destroy you suddenly. And, but thus you shall deal with them. You shall destroy their altars and break down their sacred pillars, cut down their wooden images, and burn their carved images with fire. And I, I read these verses because I want to point out that the problems that Israel is struggling and dealing with today are so similar to what they were struggling with as a nation when they first came into the promised land. And God told them, hey, you need to be serious about following my commands and completely taking over this land and completely wiping out your enemy. Because if you don't, this evil is going to come back to bite you. And that's what they're dealing with again today. Um, and, and, and in verse 6, though, I want to read this too. This is so good. Deuteronomy 7, verse 6 says, For you are holy people to the Lord your God. The Lord your God has chosen you to be a people for himself, a special treasure above all the peoples on the face of the earth. The Lord did not set his love on you nor choose you because you were more in number than any other people, for you were the least of all peoples. But because the Lord loves you and because he would keep the oath which he swore to your fathers, the Lord has brought you out with a mighty hand and redeemed you from the house of bondage, from the hand of Pharaoh, king of Egypt. And I, I finish with those verses just to remind us all that Israel is God's chosen people. And he will never forsake them. And although they are facing evil today, God is with them. God is with them, guys, and God has a heart for them. And that's why we are to have a heart for them. And understanding their position they need our support now more than ever. And that's something that uh, uh, me, me and Tom saw over there was that they're starting to recognize that the evangelical Christians actually have their back. Mm -hmm. And uh, it's, it's proven over and over again that, that, that these evangelical churches that study their Bible, <laughs> they have a heart for Israel. And they're start, they, they see that in us. And so that was encouraging to see that, that, that's, that we're making a difference, even just a small little bit. But um, the... the uh, so with that, Tom, let's go ahead and let's jump into our slideshow tonight. What do you say? Yeah. Yeah. You ready? ready. <laughs> you guys ready? All right. Tom, go ahead and tell us about this picture here. Okay. This was as we were coming through what is typically a very, very busy airport. And as we arrived there, <laughs> there was nobody in there at all. And we didn't know if we were in the right place. It, it was just so empty. That was a ghost town. Yeah. So 
our trip was basically broken into three main stages. We spent the first part of our trip in the northern part of Israel learning about the threat of Hamas or Hezbollah, which is uh, uh, threatening their northern border. And um, we stopped at this place called the Alma Research Institute. And here in this picture, uh, this, is, this is at the Alma Research Institute in northern Israel. And this is with a uh, uh, retired IDF colonel or lieutenant colonel, Sarit Zehavi. And she runs the Alma Research Institute. And their aim, they're a non-government organization that is aimed to educate as many people as possible about what's really facing Israel, about the threats that are facing Israel in the north there. And so you can actually sign up for a newsletter. If you look up Alma Research Institute in northern Israel, you can sign up for a newsletter. And um, uh, Lieutenant Colonel uh, Sarit, she will actually send out uh, a, a kind of like an intelligence report of what is going on in northern Israel. It's very informative. But uh, we saw there that the, the, the people in northern Israel are under constant threat of attack from Hezbollah. Is it, uh, I think it was 70,000 people have been misplaced, yeah. that they cannot live close to the border because Hezbollah is launching so many rockets. As a matter of fact, the day that we were there, she reported that 50 rockets were launched into Israel yeah. that day. That we were there. Yeah, that, and it was in like 20 miles from the yes. Research Institute mm -hmm. itself. And here's a picture of one of those rockets. This was captured on a security camera uh, in flight heading towards Israel there. And she said that that rocket is, ru is Russian technology. Yeah. In this picture here, the group of pastors that we were with were standing about nine kilometers from the border of Hezbollah. And with binoculars, you're able to look into some of the positions that Hezbollah is actually using to fire the rockets into Israel from. And it's a pretty interesting feeling to stand there that close to the border of Lebanon and know that you're, you're within range and might even be getting, you know, ranged at the uh, moment. Yeah, she said that they were 5,000 Hezbollah fighters that were trained at, at, that they believe they're ready to cross the border. Yeah. This picture here, guys, I, I wish I could zoom in on it a little bit, but this, this shows you the seven arenas uh, f from which Israel is facing uh, enemy activity. Uh, the, these, these countries here listed on here, you've got on the top right corner, Yemen, below the Gaza Strip, then Judea and Samaria, Iraq, Syria, and then Lebanon, and each one of those little patches, those are militia patches of uh, militias, Islamic militias that are training, and they're coordinating their efforts together to eradicate Israel. And as you notice, all of them are tied to Iran, the Iranian Re uh, Republican Guard. And Iran is the one that is funding these groups, helping them get their training, uh, and working together to coordinate all of them in a coordinated effort, as I said, to completely eradicate Israel as a nation. And, and they work publicly, and they work pr uh, underground. She even showed us a video that they had put together detailing step by step on how they were going to invade the country, and it, which was very... It was very scary to how it, it was just a matter of fact, this is what we're going to do step by step. Yeah. This next slide shows you a screenshot of my phone, and I'm sorry that you can't see it probably from where you're seated. But when, I was, when we were driving around in northern Israel, I was trying to follow along with where we were on our Google Maps. And so I'd pull up Google Maps on my phone, and every time I'd look at my Google Maps, I was not in Israel. My location was at the Beirut International Airport. And so somehow the Israeli government has some technology that keeps your phone from being able to track your exact position uh, while you're in northern Israel, probably because of the danger there. I was just hoping that Rebecca wasn't going to check my location <laughs> from the United States and wonder if I got kidnapped and carried away to the, 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 the airport in Lebanon. As a matter of fact, one of the wives was tracking her husband, yeah. and she called and said, have you been kidnapped? because she saw that he was in the Beirut International Airport, which he wasn't. 
This next slide, we see what it's like to go to church on uh, the Sabbath day in Israel for those uh, Orthodox Jews that celebrate the, the Shabbat. And this, this, this guy is just a picture of one of many, many men that we saw on Shabbat walking around with their rifles because they live in a constant state of, of threat. And so they have to be ready to meet that threat anytime. Can you imagine coming to church here like this? This, this man here in the center of the photograph, uh, so, so this is when our team was in Kafar Aza, which is one of the kibbutzes that is right next to the border of Gaza. And this man, Israel, that's his name, he was our tour guide through the kibbutz. He lives in this kibbutz. It's a kibbutz of about 1,000 Israelis. And for those of you that aren't familiar with a kibbutz, a kibbutz is basically a it's like a socialist or communist commune, in a sense, where the, the, the people all live in a commune together, and they have businesses that are run in that commune, but the earnings go towards the, the, the betterment of the commune, right? And so, and they, they'll have a, a school for the kids, and they'll also have a centralized building for security where they'll store their rifles. And I'm going to share with you in the next, uh, in a minute here, how, those, or how that worked against them. Here's your pastor in a way too small bulletproof vest. <laughs> and, that, and that was extra large. It just didn't. I mean, if they shoot me right here, I'm dead, you know, so. So he was holding his gut just to be sure he didn't get shot there. But they were making us wear these. I felt silly. Um, yeah, we all felt silly. <laughs> so. Tom, why don't you yeah, share this Yeah, and this, this is Israel. His last name is Lender. He's 66 years old. He said that he was born um, a, a decade after the last Holocaust victim was killed in, in Germany. Or, but this says behind here, these men behind were the heroic members of the guard who were killed under the siege because they were so outgunned and outnumbered because they were like 70 um, Hezbollah fighters, not Hezbollah, I'm sorry, Hamas fighters there that had invaded and they first went right to where the armory was, where all the guns were, were stashed and all the ammunition was. And they had RPGs, they had grenades, the, the Hamas did. So they only came out of their house fighting with what they had in their house. Matter of fact, the, the uh, mayor of the kibbutz came out with his gun and he was mowed down right away. But so they, so the, the, these people are in a state of mourning, a state of shock, because they have lost their neighbors. Uh, and if, if they weren't killed, then they have many neighbors that are hostages now. And that's a whole other story we'll get into in a second here. Yeah, so a lot of these guys in the picture here were actually killed trying to get to the weapons uh, there. They were just waiting for him in ambush. This, this picture here, Israel actually took us inside of his house. And Israel's house was a significant point in the battle at, in this kibbutz that took place in the kibbutz because, as you're going to see in the next pictures, the, uh, the terrorists used his house to fire down into a particular area of that kibbutz that was set apart for the young people. Uh, in these kibbutzes, once you turn 18, you move out of your house and you go to live in a, a section that is for young people. And so a lot of these guys and girls, boyfriends and girlfriends, were living together in these houses in a row of houses that was for all the 18 th through the early 20s, 20-year-olds uh, 20 in the kibbutz. And they used Israel's house. They stormed into his house and they uh, used the roof of his house to fire down into that community. And what, we, what we're going to show you next is, is one of the weaknesses of the Israeli uh, kibbutz and their system of defending themselves. You see, they're used to, every time they hear a siren, they run right into their shelters. And so that's what many of them were doing. But the problem with these, these shelters is that the, they don't lock. The doors don't lock. And so the only way to actually keep anybody from coming in is you have to, and, and I'll show you in just a second. I'll show you that in a second. But I want you guys to see. This is the um, where he held the door for 36 hours. 
Yeah, yeah we closed for covered with a, a, a metal uh, window. Yeah. Okay. So, they so and, uh, and uh, we heard everything what happened. Yeah. We heard that he is on the top, uh, on the roof, and he shooting everywhere. So that was the shelter, that's the, the bomb shelter that's built into all of these houses, not a very big room. Uh, Israel and his wife were in that particular shelter for 36 hours until the IDF finally showed up and cleared their house. And the only way to keep this door closed is to take that handle right there and twist it up. And so Israel basically had to stand at the door and, and wrench that handle up while the terrorists were outside of his door screaming at him to open his door. And uh, after a while, you know, he physically lost the, the ability to be able to even hold that handle up. He had to use, you know, clothing and stuff to tie it, and, and he was holding it from the side. But uh, very, very dangerous, you know, uh, uh, unplanned for uh, situation there. Uh, many of the Israelis were in their bomb shelters for hours, sometimes even days after uh, the attacks were over. This next shot here, that's Lloyd Pulley on your left and uh, one of the women from the kibbutz who actually lives in New Jersey as well and has a home in the kibbutz. Um, Lloyd is having her come to share at his church uh, this coming Sunday, um, but you'll see her again, but she was very thankful. That's one of the things that I, Phil and I noticed that the Israelis were so grateful for us coming because you gotta realize that there are no tour groups coming. They were just so thankful. They kept, we kept being thanked over and over again for coming um, to just to support them. And they asked why we were coming. And we said, because we, 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 God says in his word that he will bless those who bless Israel and he will curse those who curse Israel. And so we have such a heart for Israel in the evangelical church that we needed to be there just to encourage them that we love them and that we're behind them. And those words resonated with the Israelis dramatically. I was just shaken every time we had a conversation like that with them. The next series of photos that we're gonna show you are from Kafar Aza and that specific area of the compound that housed the 18 through 20 year olds and uh, this was where some of the fiercest fighting was and some of the worst things that were uh, acted out happened here. And you see the, uh, we can't see their names from here, wouldn't be able to say them anyway, but they, that they were murdered in this house. And the same thing there, uh, another young man was murdered in this home and then this young woman was murdered in her home there. And if you could see the paint on the walls there, you can tell that um, there's numbers and there's symbols and there's some different things drawn on there. And those are from different Israeli Defense Force units that came through and cleared the houses. Um, and so you'll even see dates on some of them. And some of the dates, it's so sad to see, but some of these houses were not cleared until... Uh, two, up to two days and three days after the attack happened. Yes, it, some of the uh, terrorists were even lingered and, and stayed there hidden. And so it was very treacherous even up to, you know, a couple days after October 7th. And we were not allowed to enter into just any house. The Israeli families wanted to protect what had happened to their loved ones, and so they wanted to keep that, those things private. However, there was one house that was opened up purposefully by the family because they wanted people to see what had happened. And so this next video shows just a, a little bit of entering into this house. You'll see bullet holes all around. I'm not a very good cameraman, not as good as Tom, that's for sure, but I was doing my best. And uh, I, I, I filmed the entrance to this house, and then I'm gonna show you some pictures of what took place in the house. There's no word, word that can imagine what they did us. Yes, I agree. 
after evil, actually. Even the animals. Mm -hmm. Animals sure. kill to eat and they rest. Don't yes. do nothing more. They can because they didn't stop. If you notice, Israel said they were worse than animals because animals come and eat and leave, but the Hamas terrorists just stayed and enjoyed the killing. This next picture is going to be um, hard to see, so if you don't like to see blood, you might want to avert your eyes, but this is a picture of what it looked like in this house when they first entered the house um, in, in, and found what had happened there. And that stain on the couch is blood. Um, and I have other pictures that I'm not gonna show you tonight because they're just too graphic for church. But suffice it to say that the most horrible things you can imagine took place uh, in these killings. It was absolutely brutal. And when I left this place, I was so emotionally overwhelmed that if they would have if an IDF unit would have taken me, I would have gone into Gaza with them because it was, it was that kind of rage that filled my heart uh, a, a, upon seeing the things that they enacted upon the, 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 the people that were living in these houses. This picture here, that's uh, Calvary Chapel Pastor Greg Opine um, being just graciously thanked for coming from America to stand alongside of Israel. You can see in her face just how uh, the gratitude that, she, that the Israelis had for our team being there of Calvary pastors. And this was an unusual trip because, you know, they weren't going, the pastors weren't necessarily going to speak. They were going to see and listen and listen they did. And here we have a picture of Pastor Phil um, on the left there speaking with one of the mothers whose daughter was taken hostage. And they were having a um, service there. Um, and a matter of fact, um, I, I left and I went back. I had to talk to her. And she, what she asked me to say to all, to, she said, tell the world what you saw here. Yeah, that was a message that we heard from any of the parents that were in this area is, you know, tell our children's story tell our story, echo our story to the world. And so that's why this is so important what we're doing tonight. It's so important to that we as a church are supporting Israel because they're being suppressed. All this information is being suppressed. And there's even people that deny that this even happened. The next set of pictures comes from the city of Sidrat. Sidrat is a city of about 6,000 people. And um, there were about 70 terrorists or so that showed up in Sidorat in trucks and different vehicles. And um, we were actually invited into the city municipality, and they showed us a video of when the terrorists arrived. And it's a tragic uh, scene because one car is trying to flee, an Israeli family is trying to flee from the city right as the terrorists arrive. And so the car flips around and tries to get away but it's being shot at by the terrorists in their trucks. And so the, the, I don't, and I, nobody understands why this happened, but the father actually stops his car and he opens his door, gets out and grabs his four-year-old daughter and he's running down the street trying to get away. And in the confusion, he's actually running, unbeknownst to him, he's running towards the terrorists. Mm. And, and we could see it in the video. Yeah. He comes around the corner and he's right in view of the terrorists and they opened fire on him with his four-year-old daughter in his hands. And, you know, he falls to the street. Um, thankfully, the little girl wasn't hit, but she didn't know what to do. And she's running around on the street, uh, you know, basically aimlessly, doesn't know where to go and, and, and ends up running back to the car to her mom. And we heard later, it's actually a heroic story, uh, one of the, an, an Arabic an Arabic policeman living in Sidorat actually showed up on the scene, got out of his car, got into the family's car, and he drove them mm -hmm. to what he thought was a safe place, um, which was the police station. Little did he know the police station was actually under attack by terrorists, and so he drove them uh, right to their deaths. The, the mother was killed, the policeman was killed. Um, the two children did survive, thankfully. 
but it, it's just, just a tragic story that happened here in the city of Sudarat. This, this picture is of one of the uh, ambulance stations in uh, Sudarat, and this is where one of the, uh, basically a heroic story came out of this one. Tom, you want to share about yeah, her? Yeah, uh, both. Well, the lady in the middle wasn't, didn't get into help till later, but the guy that's on your left there, uh, you know, they were shooting ambulances. They were shooting the drivers. One was shot. So they were getting calls all day. Hey, please come pick somebody up. Someone's lying in a pool of blood in front of our house. But the terrorists were just waiting for them to shoot them. So, but heroically, they, once they could, they were going and grabbing people and throwing. But the trouble is, is they couldn't take them to the hospital. They were bringing them to the station right there. So they had um, people piled up there because this is the only place that they could take them uh, for the longest time because I think the hospital was 45 minutes away. And because these, these ambulances were not bulletproof, they, were, they would get shot up. So it was uh, quite a heroic thing to, to even get people from that were laying in the streets. Yeah, and eventually they were able to get one bulletproof ambulance into the city, and they began to shuttle the, the, the victims, the wounded, one at a time, 45 minutes away where another ambulance would be waiting, and they would take them from there to a hospital. Then that ambulance would come back. The bulletproof ambulance would come back. They did this over and over and over again until they got all of their, their worst uh, patients out of the, the uh, station there. So truly heroic deed that they... they um, that, that, that went on that day from the uh, ambulance station there. This particular gal was um, a, psychi uh, a psychiatrist, and she's trained in um, counseling for trauma. And she was telling us that she has done nothing but meet with victims uh, since October the 7th, and that actually in Israel there's a huge need for counselors right now. Um, because there's so many people that are suffering from the traumatic events of what they saw on October the 7th and, and, and you know, the aftermath of that, that they're, they're overwhelmed right now. But she was actually a joy to speak to because she was uh, actually really understanding the problem at its root. And she said, you know what? We've done a lot of things wrong. Why are we the ones building bomb shelters and running to the bomb shelters we need to make the Palestinian people build bomb shelters. And when they shoot at us, we need to shoot 10 times as much back at them. And they need to see what it's like to live under the post-traumatic stress of rocket fire all the time. And so she was actually wake, awake to the, the truth, you know, and wanting to see changes made. And uh, I want to point out in the background there behind her on that wall, <clears throat> you can see that's act, those are actually blood stains from bodies that were stacked against that wall. And... I don't have the picture of it. I just didn't want to put it in, but you could see the blood trail running all the way down to the street. And this is right across the street from a police station where the fiercest battle took place in Sidrat. And what happened is the terrorists took the policemen by surprise. They went into the station, killed all the policemen inside the police station, and then they set up in there and started shooting people from the police station. And there was such a fierce battle there that took place. There were, there were wounded and dead people laying in the street all around this police station. And finally, what Israel did is they just came in with a huge bulldozer and they bulldozed the entire police station building down on top of the terrorists that were inside of it, still alive. Hmm. Yes. And that, that police station is now completely leveled. There's nothing there. And they're going to build a monument here yeah. in the city of Sidorat. Right now, it's just an empty field. This is a round came through, and you'll see, oh, well, maybe it's not the next picture, but in a little bit picture farther down, Pastor Phil standing in the room. If he had been standing there when that round came through the building, it would have gone right through him here. But I think the pictures got pushed. Uh, yeah, this is, this is in the city municipality building. This is the office where the treasurer for the city works. And if he would have been sitting at his desk, he would have been uh, dead for sure. But this, this is just an example of what they live with. These rockets come in. This is actually an anti-tank missile. 
and it came through the wall, uh, went all the way through the door of his office, went out into the common area of the office area, and exploded the copy machine. So, um, and, and, you know, thankfully there was no one in, in that portion of the office at the time. And here we got Pastor Phil and Ken Graves on the right-hand side praying for that one uh, psychiatrist that, as Pastor Phil said, she really had a handle on this whole thing because she's just seen the trauma now with her people, with the Israelis. So they're just trying to encourage her and praying for her. And she, when asked if she would accept prayer, she gladly accepted prayer. So that's how we ended off with her. And then we were at... Uh, at, at the end of that day, you can see how bright low the sun was there in the background. Uh, but um, it's uh, Marcus McClure in the middle. Uh, he, is, uh, he, he was the one who organized the trip from Inspired Travel. He owns it, and he's there just blessing some of the Israeli soldiers who very, a lot of them speak excellent English. So you could, it's easy to talk to them. And then same Marcus McClure is speaking with an Israeli and just telling him, you know, when asked why we came, he's saying, because you're in my heart. Yeah, and that particular station was completely volunteer run. Mm. So volunteers from all over Israel are bringing food and they have a huge tent set up there and they actually have a, a counseling station. They have books for the soldiers. They have um, some, a haircut station. They have uh, just a whole bunch of different things that the soldiers can do and it's entirely volunteer run. Um, to support the IDF. And some of these soldiers that we talked to at this place had already been into Gaza three times on three different missions and been in and out, and they were stopping there to get free food, um, which, which smelled really good, by the way. <laughs> Again, I just wanted to point out that all the buildings in the kibbutzes that had been cleared by the military had these paint markings on them. And uh, any of the buildings that had this red paint on them were an indication that a dead body or body parts had been found in these buildings. This building here actually shows you the shrapnel. If you can see it in the shadows of the tree, there's a lot of pock marks from shrapnel. This is from a missile that hit in the street about 12 feet away, about 12 to 15 feet away from the building and sprayed shrapnel all over the building and actually killed this young lady who's on that sticker that's on the side of the, the building here. Um, she was killed at this location by this missile. Uh, and what, what happened is the missile came in. You could see the crater mark there where it hit the street and then exploded. The shrapnel came up around the whole building. She was with another soldier. He was able to get down flat completely. The shrapnel flew over him. Uh, she only made it to a kneeling position and subsequently was killed by the shrapnel. It went through her head. And so this is why they were telling us uh, they told us this multiple times when we got on the bus. If you hear a siren, the bus will stop, get off the bus, and go lay down flat on the ground. And that's what we were told every day that we got on the bus. After we heard the story about this young lady, I don't think any of us would, would have hesitated to go in flat to get out of the way because it was serious business. So after our day visiting the kibbutzes and the city of Sidrat, we um, spent the next day at Hostage Square in Tel Aviv, where many of the families had set up memorials. Sorry. Okay, so, yeah, it's not up there. So this is what they've set up for Shabbat. There's a chair for all the hostages. And if someone's released, they'll pull that chair out. But you can they, notice, notice the baby bottles for the yeah. little ones. Their hostages were taken from eight months old all the way up to age 87, 248 of them. And this, this table was set for all 248 of the hostages. Yeah. And, you know, these posters all are, are everywhere. Uh, bring them back. And it, there's a... In Israel, you know, coming as we left America, I, you know, I said, well, that's terrible that you have hostages. But when you get to Israel, you realize how much a part of their being right now is caught up in these hostages. It's, it's just, it's, it's in their hearts. They're, it's just killing them yeah. of what they're having to, to deal with these that are still in enemy hands. So here's an... 
just some more, just, um, just another group. And this is the one that Phil was talking about, the little, little uh, baby there, I wouldn't say celebrated, but had his first birthday while in captivity. And so what kind of people would kidnap a baby? So this video is of a uh, one of the families of the ho of one of the hostages. His name is Alan. Uh, he's a piano player, and so his family took his piano and set it up in Hostage Square, and they did that so that anybody who wants can come and play on his piano. And they set a sign up on on top of it that says "You are not alone," um, based, and it's 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 a play on his name, Alon, uh, Alon, Alon. You are not alone, and they they um, have. Uh, reported that there are world famous uh, piano players that have showed up out of the blue in Hostage Square and sat down on this piano and begun to play. And this actually happened while we were in the square. So. So it was something that was just really special. It was pretty moving in the moment. That's Pastor Ed Ray on the left there, and he was trying to share the love of Christ with this Israeli man. And, um, you know, because he, he wanted to know, the man wanted to know why we were there, why Pastor Ed from uh, a Calvary Chapel down in Redlands, California. Um, and so... He shared his love of, of Christ with him and the love of Jesus. Um, and then, of course, the guy rejected it, but he tried. And you see him walking away there like, oh, no, it's not for me walking away. This, this um, picture was taken in a building that has been donated um, by... Uh, Israel, an Israeli business and set up as a headquarters for the hostage uh, uh, situation. And there are actually 15 former diplomats, uh, retired Israeli diplomats, including one who served in Washington, D.C. Yeah. And uh, they are all working together to apply pressure on the Israeli government as well as uh, uh, the world, it, as many people as will listen. And so they, right here in this, in this room is a conference room, and we sat down and heard from the director of this movement to bring the hostages home. And it was uh, quite impactful. They actually had one of the fathers of the victims come into the room and share his story. And his story is about his son, who was at the festival in southern Israel, where the terrorists came up and actually killed about 200 young people at this festival while they were, it was basically an outdoor concert. And uh, as the shooting began, his son jumped into a car with three of his friends and they tried to flee that place. And as he was driving away, one of the girls that was with him in the car was shot and di uh, killed instantly there in the car. They stopped the car and everybody got out and ran in different directions. Well, two of the, two of the other passengers were killed by gunfire, but his son was not uh, heard of again for several weeks. And so he was basically missing in action. And the father was just sharing how that, you know, was such a crazy time for him to, to be, you know, waiting to find out what's, they're going to find his body or we're going to find out he's a hostage. Well, he said, we found out from the IDF that he was taken hostage and he said, I was happy, but it was a mixed happiness. Like, well, how happy should I be hmm. because of where he's at now? His name is Hanan Yablanka, yeah. uh, is the hostage, and the father is Revan. And you see him leaning over there to point out to all of us which one was his son. He knew exactly on that uh, group of pictures which, where his son was located. And this next picture, you see Pastor Ed Ray and Pastor Phil. They're just listening to, as the diplomats are kind of diagramming of what their efforts have been and how they've been pressuring the different governments. And now Pastor Ken Graves has an opportunity to pray for the Father. And we just took that time to pray for him individually here, for his son and for him as well. And, and once again, it was it was such a blessing to see the way that they responded to these uh, times. They they're they're so thankful 
to know that there are people that are supporting them. They're so thankful to know that there's people that uh, love Israel. This, this is a picture I took uh, that I saw. I saw actually several posters of this around Hostage Square. It says, shame on, you, on the Red Cross. And um, there's actually a video of uh, Brandon Holdhouse from Rock Harbor Church who was with us on this trip. He is videoing a, an Israeli citizen who is uh, basically heading up a movement to try to remove the Red Cross from Israel because they have, the, 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 one of the, the directors of Red Cross lives in Tel Aviv, right here close to this, this square. And uh, yet the Red Cross did not mobilize. They did not do anything. They didn't lift a finger to go down and help the Israeli people who, who were being butchered. And so the, there's, a, there's a big uprising right now. That, you know, there's a, there's a movement to, to call them out for this. Um, and uh, you can actually see that that, that, that that video is actually a part of an interview that Brandon Holdhouse did in Hostage Square. We'll have it up on our website uh, after, after this night. This is set up by the family of the little uh, eight-month-old that was taken. And it's just heartbreaking. It's heartbreaking. We have um, Sammy Smajda, who is the uh, the director of SRL, but he's also working for TBN and doing the interviews. It was very important for them to capture this to show um, show their viewers. That, that's Ken Graves and Lloyd Pulley on the first interview there, just asking them, why did you feel it was important to come? And so the pastors could explain to them their heart for Israel, because if, if there's any such time, this is the time that Israel needs to hear why we love them. So we were, we were um, I was thankful to be a part of a, a group of pastors that got selected, and we actually were on TBN there with uh, Sammy Smajda, and he was interviewing us, asking us these questions as to what, what, why the Lord had put it on our heart to be there. It was a special time. Then we had, uh, I, I want to close out the night just sharing a few praise reports with you guys because some of the things that we've looked at tonight, they're very heavy. It's hard to, uh, uh, to process all this, I'm sure. But um, some of the praise reports that came out of this, uh, just a couple of quick things. First of all, one, one praise report for me was I got to meet Joel Rosenberg. That's Joel Rosenberg and his wife. Yeah, so that was really cool to sit down at dinner with him and to hear him talk. The man is a genius. Um, He's involved in several ministries over there in Israel. One of them I want to tell you guys about because I think this could be really helpful for you. He runs a ministry that actually collects trustworthy news from Israel and, um, and then publishes that in an email form. And so that news network is called All Israel News. And um, if any of you have ever uh, seen a, a website like Drudge Report or um, What Finger News or something like that. It's a compilation of a whole bunch of news articles. What he does is he, he basically goes through them, vets them, and then puts together a, a list of trustworthy news that's coming out of Israel. And so it's called allisraelnews.com. You can go to that. You can subscribe to their, their newsletter, and he'll email that to you on a daily basis, I believe. Um, but he's one of my uh, favorite authors. Uh, if any of you guys have ever read uh, Epicenter, it's a great book about how the prophecy uh, epicenter of the Bible is Jerusalem. Uh, and he's also written several other great books. I encourage you guys to check out if, uh, if you get a chance. This is the group in its entirety here. Um, this is another one of the praise reports for me was just being around all of these other pastors that love Israel. It was a great, uh, great time uh, of fellowship together and some new friendships were formed, and some old friendships were strengthened, and it was just a, a, a good time of fellowship with these pastors. The next set of pictures I want to show you very quickly, these are all pastors of Messianic Jewish congregations, either in Jerusalem or in different parts of Israel. And this particular young man is an Ethiopian Jew. Um, and so he pastors an Ethiopian Jewish congregation, Along with this guy here, this is another pastor of an Ethiopian Jewish congregation in Jerusalem. Then this, uh, I don't, so I'm just going to go through these because I don't know where all of them are pastoring, but they're all pastors representing Messianic Jewish congregations now in Jerusalem and around Jerusalem. And I was just so blessed to see that God is working. 
right now in Israel, working to bring uh, people to Christ, bringing people to Yeshua. Now, the next thing, this is about a five-minute video. This is the last thing that we have for you guys. But this is a really amazing testimony from a young man named Ramin, who was born and raised in Iran. He's now in Israel. He's a part of a Jewish Messianic congregation. He married a Jewish woman. And um, they together share their story uh, all over the, wherever they're invited to be. And I actually got his contact information. I'm hoping to invite him. He does travel to the United States from time to time. The next time he's here, I'm hoping that I can get him to come to Reno and share his story, uh, the, the entirety of his story with us. But this is about five minutes of his story right here. Can we turn that way up, please? such a presence, such a holy presence in my room. 
And I was full of the Holy Spirit. I didn't even know what the Holy Spirit was. But I was full of joy. I was full of peace. I was jumping up and down. I was full of light. I went to my mom's house. My mom saw me. She said, what happened to you? And I said, oh, she said, your face is shiny. Because you know, before I was grumpy and sad and depressed. And I told her what happened to me. Uh, and my mother was suffering from a disease, a chronic disease. And she was in pain. And I just had this confidence that if I pray for my mom, she will be healed. So I pray for my mother in the name of Yeshua. I said, Jesus, he saw you in part six. And my mom got healed. So my mom became my first doctor. And my sister, my brother. So there's a big underground movement in Iran. Millions of people <coughs> becoming believers. Uh, I can tell you right now that 98, 99% of the people of Iran, they love Israel. The people. Because they are so oppressed by Islam. They hate Islam, they're looking for answers, and they feel Israel is suffering from the same enemy that they are suffering from. Isn't that amazing? Say the, the joy of the Lord is his strength now. Amen. And so that was one of the, the highlights of the trip for me was just to see that God is in the midst of the brutality and the killing and the heaviness of all of that. God is still working and he's moving to save individuals there in, in Israel, in Jerusalem. And that's a really exciting thing, you guys, um, uh, because that is a sign uh, that, you know, that, that the Lord is, is, is beginning to, to uh, um, bless and turn his attention to the people of Israel. I think before the rapture comes, uh, taking many of them to be with him. Uh, and then, and then we, don't, we all know that the, the, the remnant there will go into the tribulation time. And it is actually at the end of the tribulation that they are going to recognize Jesus Christ when he returns. They're going to see, look upon whom, him whom they have pierced, and they're going to understand who he is. But in the meantime, uh, they, there, there are many that are getting saved. And it's just an encouragement to me uh, to see that. So with that, uh, we want to end our night uh, with a prayer for Israel. And I'm going to actually invite um, one of our elders, Dave Rutherford, if you wouldn't mind coming up. I, I asked him before the service if he wouldn't mind just praying us out. Um, I, I feel like it would be uh, just better to have someone that was just a part of the audience tonight just seeing all of this um, and, and just to, to have them pray us out tonight. Um, thank you so much. And, and uh, let me uh, pass the mic off to Dave here. Thank you. Well, first of all, um, we want to thank the Lord for bringing Pastor Phil and Tom back to us safely. And just for the incredible opportunity they had to be in his land. You know, that's, that's amazing over there. Well, as soon as Pastor Phil said something to me, um, my mind got flooded with stuff. And it was hard for me to listen. And so I had to write it down. But my eyes are bad, so I can't really see it. But what, it, what, what, what encouraged me was many of the things I felt the Lord was impressing upon my heart we're already set up here. So some of it may sound re like repetition, but I just feel that's a confirmation that the Lord is behind it. So let's, let's pray. Lord, we lift up your people, Israel, and pray that your blessings, protection, and deliverance would be upon them. And we know that as Gentiles, they are your chosen people and we are grafted in. So your people are our people and we stand with them. Yes. Father, comfort the families of those that were taken and remind them how precious they are in your sight. Your word says that you will bless those that bless them and curse those that curse them. So as we stand with Israel, may your blessing and favor be with us individually, corporately, and I pray nationally. May our nation always support Israel. And yet in all of this, we have hope because it, as Israel continues to be attacked, yet without defeat, and the world turns against them, it proves that you are God, that your word is true, and that the end seems near. May we walk worthy in these last days. But most of all, Lord, we pray that the eyes of the Jewish nation would be open to the true Messiah, Jesus Christ. Lord, we love you, we praise you, and we ask all these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Thanks, Dave. All right. Well, that concludes our evening. Thank you so much for coming. And wherever you can, share these stories, share these testimonies, and um, let's, let's make these hostages stories known so that we can get them home and let's support Israel. God bless you guys. Thank you for being here tonight.